Hey Sargon, a little while ago I watched your post-debate video where you're talking about uh, your performance in the debate between you and Christy Winters, and I was like, oh, there was a debate, so I went to go check it out. I've watched about 40 minutes of it so far, about all I can handle in one sitting, to be frank. And uh, you're always going to be at a disadvantage when you debate with a feminist or a leftist or any uh, social justice warrior, creationist, anything like that, uh, because of buzzwords. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. The buzzwords show up all the time. But not the obvious ones that you'll think about, like patriarchy. They're, they're far more ubiquitous than that uh, in their use, and people don't really think about them all that much. And they're like, what does it really mean when someone says X? Or what is, what is really being referred to by Y? So in the section of, of the debate where she uh, was talking about data collection, she was trying to take you to task about uh, survey methods and social network data and, and whatnot, and talking about looking at things through the feminist lens and the United States, the, or the West, and the developing world, and in, anyway, whatever. So uh, think about uh, two concepts she mentioned, uh, one of which was about re the reliability of the data and how these techniques obviously work, because we have marketing campaigns that are successful, this is used in selling products, marketing things, economics and whatnot, and the developing world. So success and the developing world, these are buzzwords. Um, I, I can tell you uh, what, what people mean when they say the developing world. They mean nothing by it. Uh, if you go look at organizations that use this language, like the United Nations, other international organizations do this too, but the United Nations is the most prominent, so I'll just stick with them. Whenever they use developing, the developing world, developing country, developed world, developed country, uh, you have to go read through the fine print to find, out, uh, to find the caveat. Uh, we don't wish to express any opinion about whether or not any country is or isn't developed. Uh, this is a term that doesn't have a definition. We use it only for in-house statistical convenience. Uh, you should not draw any inferences from our using it because it doesn't mean anything and we don't mean to imply anything by using it. But the developing world, it's just gibberish. Uh, so when Bernie Sanders talks about uh, a great country or a developed country or an undeveloped or a developing country, uh, he's not really saying anything. If you, if you like, try to nail him to the wall to say, please define what counts, constitutes a developing country and what constitutes a developed country, and you'll get some very wishy-washy shit like, oh, uh, in, anyway, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, you'll be happy to learn that if, if you're a country, you can be developed, you can be developing, or you can be neither developed nor developing. You're just there. Now, if you look at uh, how these arrangements are typically done, the United States is obviously a developed country. Good job for us. And so are our best friends and allies. Good job for you guys. Lucky you. And if uh, you have a long history of not being particularly friendly with the United States, you might find yourself not even on the list. Like, say, for some inexplicable reason, Central Europe and uh, some independent states in Western Europe, for, uh, I'm sorry, Eastern Europe, for example, uh, which are neither developed nor developing. Um, one of the, the most powerful countries on the planet, Russia, is not developed and is not developing. It just exists in some unspecified state uh, that just doesn't qualify. Many other uh, countries around the world are like that. But I'll give you a, a, an, an example of the incoherence of, of the term. Think about Argentina. It is a developing uh, country. It has aspirations to one day grow up and no longer be downtrodden, to, to reach to great heights and be an economy of note and, and a country of dignity and power and development. Simultaneously, it's on the G20. So, uh, depending on which list you want to look at uh, on any given day of the week, it is this downtrodden, near third world country Simultaneously, it, it shares a chair at a table at a conference with the United States for the most powerful economies on the planet. Who knew you could be one of the most powerful economies in the world and not be a developed country? You can be third world and yet super duper important. Uh, Mirabile dictu, wonderful to tell. So that's the incoherence there. Now, when she's talking about successful, uh, success in the context of marketing. Uh, only means that you have gotten more out of it than you put into it. So you've, you've got a return on your investment and you know, you've know you made money, congratulations. So you've, if you think about uh, popularity, the most popular types of items, think about something like uh, the world's best-selling toy, the Rubik's Cube. 
350 million ish units have been sold in four decades around the world. That's a lot of selling of Rubik's cubes. Of course, when you think about that, three, you know, 350, 400 million units sold out of 7.2 billion people, almost most you know most of the world has looked at the product and said uh, thank you no for all the marketing for all the availability for all the access we've thought about it thanks keep it uh you know the playstation uh the iphone that's like a half billion units of the iphone sold and if you assume that it's one iphone per person that no repeat customers then then something like you know 85 percent of the world has said no thank you now that has a high price point so it's hard to get in, in a lot of countries that don't have a great deal of disposable income. They can't afford it. That makes sense. But let's look at things uh, that have been around for forever and a day and have the greatest penetration in the market around the world. And I can't think of anything um, that has quite uh, the market share as Christianity does. It's had thousands of years, and it has literally tried every marketing uh, scheme out there. And I don't mean scheme in any sideways. I mean, I just mean every every way of marketing it they've tried uh, cajoling persuasion preaching putting people to the sword burning the heretics putting people on the rack for wanting to read the bible in english uh, a book that is that has uh, had uh, dispersed throughout the world between five and six billion copies and over thousands of years uh, right now five-sevenths of the world population has said thank you we've we've looked at the product we've heard the sales pitch we're not signing up for it so one of the most popular things in the history of the world I can think of, Christianity, uh, the overwhelming majority of the world's population, having heard about it, having been exposed to it, uh, has said, thanks, no, we don't want a part of that. So um, when you talk about success in, in the context of marketing, you're going for a share of the market, uh, market of ideas, market of toys, whatever it happens to be. And if you can get a, a tiny percentage of that market where you are getting out of the market more than you're putting into the market, you are successful. So when you when you want to like translate this into social theories and all the survey data and everything she was talking about, um, or sociological theories, they're not overwhelmingly successful theories. Uh, base stereotypes are better predictors, better models of society of behavior than the best of sociological uh, models. Um, so all the all the survey data they collect, all the stuff, and they draw their they come with their little pet theories and their ideas about this and whatnot. It models a a small fraction of a population. You may, maybe even up to like 15 or 20 percent of the population will be modeled by it. But uh, that that is a successful model in that context. In the same way that selling uh, 300 million units when you could have sold 7.2 billion units, but you know, the 7.2 billion minus the three and a, uh, 350 million uh, people didn't want what you had to sell. Nevertheless, it's successful because in comparison to your competition, you are doing better than they are. When you think about like a, a popular movie, I don't think there's a movie that more than uh, you know, half the population goes out to the theater to see. So if it gets, a, you know, if a movie gets like a billion dollars throughout its run, which is really good in comparison to the rest, uh, nevertheless, it remains the case that most people chose not to go watch that product. The overwhelming majority of people just said, uh, thank you, we'll pass. That is still, in that context, a very successful film because it made so much more money than was put in to make it. Nevertheless, most people, more than half the population, having looked at it, thought about it, said, we'll give it a pass. That is what is meant by uh, the slippery term, successful. It doesn't mean that most people sign up to it. It doesn't mean it's a great predictor of more than half the population. It means that within some share of a market or some subset, some proper subset of a set, it has some validity somewhere, some of the time. It, is, it, it just doesn't have this overwhelming power that she wants to pretend that it has. And so you're always going to be at a disadvantage when you talk to them because these fundamental things that people uh, hear um, about the great power of this or the great wonderfulness of that or the marketing you know selling of whatever it is it it, it is all within a context in the same way when you want to talk about uh, in the united states and our our uh, ostensibly large murder rate uh you know we have some some terribly high murder rate less than uh less than it is in argentina which sometimes is developed sometimes developing depends on 
which meeting is being had, I guess. You have to remember that it, it's large per capita. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a high um, number of people. When you zoom in, you know, five, six orders of magnitude cl closer than what you would look at it like a normal spread of data, and then you focus on this, and then you say, well, look at this large change. It is a large change once you have have changed um, the the window through which you're viewing the data. So in, in mathematics, people who take mathematics courses run into the, all this uh, run into this problem all the time and is choosing a viewing window on their calculator to look at how a particular function operates. Uh, you learn this in trigonometry and then later on in calculus you learn how to do it. Uh, but it's um, when you have a function that approximate, say a sinusoidal function of some type, a sine wave of some type, you can approximate that out to some specified degree, some specified level into the future, you know, some viewing window. Uh, and if you, you set up the the viewfinder there within these constraints, you'll go, oh my god, that is a sine wave. And then when you zoom out, you go, that is not, that is totally not a sine wave. And you can do this out arbitrarily as far as you'd like uh, by, by, well, I won't go into it, but there's a way to do it. And so as, as long as uh, you know what you're doing and you know how to play with the data and uh, you have that, that degree of sophistication with the underlying material, you, you can play this game and someone who's not similarly well trained in that that same game won't know the rules of it, and they won't know why they're being deceived. They won't even know that they are being deceived, and yet uh, they are being given, uh, you know, it, it is a Potemkin, it, Potemkin data. <laughs> I don't know where I pulled that out of, but anyway. So, uh, back to the trigonometry example with the sine wave. So you have the sine, what appears to be a sine wave, until you zoom out and you look at it and you say, oh my god, that function does that, way out of, you know, how arbitrarily far out. This is totally not a sine wave, and yet on that restricted domain that you've been given, it looks just like it's saying something impressive, and just like it is that thing, even when in reality, it's nothing like that thing. It only looks like it because it's an illusion, and your professor or your instructor knows more about it than you know, and he can play this game with you for this, uh, this amount of time. So in any event, um, you have to remember that it, it is um, an apparent... Uh, with respect to the, the murder rate I was talking about, it is apparently large once you have zoomed in those five orders of magnitude closer uh, than, than otherwise. So, you know, when you, get, you if you get under a microscope, those sperm look huge, and nevertheless, they remain extraordinarily tiny. You know, those bacteria, they, that thing is ginormous, and in reality, it isn't. It's because you have magnified it so much that uh, very minute changes appear to be very large, but it's only apparently very large, and it only can be referred to very large so long as you remember that you're looking at this very restricted domain, this very zoomed uh, in view of the data. And so when she talks about success, it's on that restricted definition. It doesn't mean majority, it doesn't mean you know anything like that, it means on this very narrow uh, proper subset of some set, it has some validity here, has some validity there, and whatever. And then when she talks about how the, the, uh, the uh, not survey data, but the, uh, the social network data aren't inherently unreliable. Yes, they are inherently unreliable, and they're inherently unreliable precisely because they're not representative. All right, uh, you're not dealing with probabilistic samples there. You're not dealing with probabilistic populations. Uh, anyway, so yes, that is inherently unreliable. All right, I'll just leave that there, and uh, you have a wonderful day, sir.